Alternate Shadows are proud to present What Nuts of My Dad by Brian Walsh. You never met me, Dad, did you? No, of course you didn't. How could you have? Sometimes it felt like I'd never met him myself. Does that make any sense to you? No, I suppose it doesn't. He always called me Martina. Everybody else called me Marty. But look, I'll explain that later. Me dad was... Well, how do I put this? I don't know. He was... He was... Yeah, I know. When I was about eight or nine, something like that, there was this teacher, Mrs. Boyle. Conus? Ah, Conus. Irish means please be quiet. Conus! Oh, shut up. I said Conus. Oh, if you lot don't shut up now, I will come down there and rip your fingernails off one by one. Thank you. That was Mrs. Boyle. Nice. A bit, you know, all over the show, but nice with it. You know that sort of way. In fairness, it was a strange class. Now, whose underpants are these? And how did they end up on my chair? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone care to comment? She had her little phrases. You know, the way these people do. Your pencil should be doing the talking, not you. But like I say, she was nice. You'd never forget some of the stuff she came out with. Now, I want all the boys to walk up to the front of the class and place your balls on the table where I can see them. But that's not the point. Or maybe, in a way, it is. Anyways, one day Mrs Boyle had this idea. Now, boys and girls, corners there. Corners, I am talking. Now, boys and girls, I want you to go home tonight and I want you to ask your dads what they do for a living. And tomorrow, I'll ask you all about it. On one hand, she fancied herself as the next Miss Jean Brody. And then I'll find out about what your dads do. And on the other hand, she was just plain nosy. Well, boys, I've never seen such a collection of balls in all my life. This was Ireland in 1970. 1970, the year Chelsea won the cup. Different times. That there was no talk of what your mammies did for a living or any of that sort of stuff. Truth be told, I don't think any teacher would ask a question like that these days. But like I said, different times. Now, we'll all stand for the Angelus. You see, Chelsea had beaten QPR in the quarter-final of the Cup that Saturday and the match was on the telly. (laughs) Match of the day, you know. So yeah, Peter Osgood. You remember Peter Osgood? You must remember Peter Osgood. Best player of all time, if you ask me. You know, he scored in every round of the Cup that year. Amazing player. He was my absolute hero. Anyway, he scored a hat-trick in the match and well, I... Don't forget now. Ask your dads what they do for a living. I spent the evening trying to recreate Osgood's hat-trick out in the backyard with Jimmy Rorty. The thing was, that took time. This was 1970. Match of the day was on once. And that was that. No downloading or uploading from the internet. Just one viewing and that was it. Jimmy and I had a big argument about the first goal. I said he ran the length of the pitch with the ball. But Jimmy said it was a pass from Charlie Cook. We nearly came to blows over it. And I'll ask the class all about it tomorrow. So I never did ask me ma what me dad did for a living. I'd never have dreamt of asking me dad. Well, you didn't, did you? Well, I didn't. I would have seen images of little girls holding on to their dad's hands. You know, on the telly and in films. But it never struck me that that should be me. The little girls were not like me. 
and know where the da's like my da. So I never asked. Conus! I said Conus! That's better. Now, let's see how you all got on with my little project. We all stared gormlessly in her general direction. Now, who should I ask first? Forty or so eyes hit the ground. I'll start with Sarah. Yes, that's where I'll start. Now, Sarah, will you tell me, or I mean tell us, all about your dad? And that should have been that. A normal teacher would have started with Sarah and then picked the person next to Sarah and then the person next to that and so on until the bell rang or whatever. But not Mrs Boyle. Because Mrs Boyle believed in Darwin's theory of random selection and was as likely to pick the person furthest away from Sarah as pick the person right beside her. If she had done it the way it should have been done, then we could have all worked out what the chances were. Very good, Sarah. Very interesting. Now, where will I go next? You see the problem. You can't relax with that sort of carry-on. Jimmy Rotty, he sat in the seat in front of me, and he spent some time examining her pattern. He liked that sort of stuff to Jimmy. He told us once how much petrol it would take to get a car to Mars. Interesting, but not very useful. Anyway, his research showed that there were four seats in the middle of the class that never got asked. I think we're here from... from... yes. Let's see, yes sir. We're here from Jimmy next. Jimmy Rorty. Like I said, Interesting, but not very useful. Research isn't all it's cracked up to be. If Mrs Boyle had thought the whole thing through, she could have had us all doing arithmetic at the same time as she was getting all the goss on our dads. But no, that's your Darren is for you. All evolutionary stuff, no strategy involved. Very good, Jimmy. Very good indeed. You clearly did a lot of research last night. Of course he did. Now, where next? The tension was growing as the Darrenists picked us off one by sweating one. Oh, Sarah and Jimmy were thrilled with themselves. But the rest of us were in serious danger of needing new underwear. Danny, Danny, why don't you tell us what your dad does for a living? There was a momentary relief as various little buttocks all across the class relaxed. And then we all looked at Danny and wondered what would happen next. Danny Breslin. On you go, Danny. I'm listening. Ah, uh, well, me dad works in a porridge making factory where they make um, porridge. He didn't. He was doing four years for armed robbery. His job is to stir stuff. Yeah, he does the stir. The stirring of, um... Porridge. I don't know what his ma had told him. It takes four years to make porridge. But I reckon she'd had some fun with it. Me ma only gets to visit me da once a month in the porridge making factory. This was a time before parent teacher meetings and all that sort of stuff. She has to take the bus to Dublin. A time when teachers didn't really know a lot about your family circumstances. Because me da is doing his porridge making in Dublin. Until they had little ideas, like the one Mrs Boyle had. Me ma says that me da is in deep joy in Dublin, and she says that the people that gave him the job are a bunch of... I think that will do, Danny. Yes, that, that will do, Danny. Very interesting. I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that your dad is in um, in the porridge-making factory um, in uh, Dublin. <laughs> Very interesting. Now, you would think, wouldn't you? that having had this happen, that any self-respecting teacher would have called a halt to the whole thing. But no, like I said, Mrs Boyle was a Darwinist. A creationist would have probably packed up and gone home by now, but not Mrs Boyle. Let it evolve, see where it goes. The survival of the stupidest. So, uh, who should we have next? Buttocks clenched. I think we'll have Martina. Buttocks come very close to opening and emptying their contents. 
Martina, tell us all about your dad. A very pale version of myself stood up. Sweat was beginning to take over my external areas. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see someone explaining to Danny Bresland where exactly his story had fallen apart. I wanted the ground to swallow me up, but Jimmy Rorty had told me that in all the recorded history, the ground had never swallowed anyone up on request. This should be very interesting. I thought to myself, what would Peter Osgood do in a situation like this? I had never got around to asking me ma about what me dad did. I didn't dream of asking him. Well, you didn't, did you? I had nothing. Nothing at all. All I could offer Mrs. Boyle was clusters of sweat. Jimmy Rorty was probably already making some sketches of the main areas of dampness. Off you go, Martina. Osgood. What would Peter Osgood do? It's funny the things that cross your mind at moments like that. Things that are irrelevant and unhelpful. I had been convinced that Osgood had run the length of the pitch with the ball at his feet for his first goal against QPR. But as I stood there in my sea of sweat, I had a clear vision that Charlie Cook had passed the ball to Osgood, who had simply stuck it in the back of the net. How could I have forgotten that? How could I? I'd seen it a couple of nights ago on Match of the Day. Martina? How could I not know what my dad did for a living? How could I not know that? I'd lived with him for the past eight or nine years. How could I admit that I didn't have a clue about him? That I knew next to nothing about my dad? You look a little... My dad plays for Chelsea. That's what I said. My dad played for Chelsea. Pardon? Chelsea FC, I said. Chelsea? The class started to laugh, which was great for them, but not so great for me. Had they evaluated the situation using basic psychological tools, they might have worked out that the young, vulnerable girl, such as the one before them, was in need of comfort and support rather than laughter and ridicule. But as a rule, eight-year-old school children are generally not in the possession of such psychological tools. So they laughed. Chelsea! <laughs> Mrs Boyle was also trying to work it out. She didn't know what me dad did for a living, but she was reasonably sure that he didn't play for Chelsea FC. She might have had some sympathy for the poor, pathetic little wretch that stood in front of her, but the laughter swung her into a defensive I'm losing control of the situation mode. Oh, now. She didn't see a scared little sweaty child in front of her. She saw Sheikh Shavara leading a revolution from her savage deaths of a sweaty South American jungle. Oh, now. The only thing that could quell an insurrection of this nature was to beat the leader with a stick. Martina, stand by my desk. And make an example of them to all his followers. Sarah, will you get my stick from the discipline drawer? And then there was a knock at the door. I thought it might have been Peter Osgood coming to claim me as his long lost daughter. But no. It was Father McKenna asking if he could do his talk on Christian forgiveness today, as he wouldn't be available tomorrow. Of course, Father, but of course, sure. <laughs> We're all delighted to have you talking to us, aren't we, children? Father McKenna gave his talk on Christian forgiveness to us. And maybe it was the talk, or maybe it was something else, but no beating ever took place. The bell does not mean that you get up and run out of the door. Me ma was different, knew her, knew her every thought. Well, maybe not every thought, but most of them. I could sense her anxiety about meeting new people. Felt her concerns as she sat beside me, staring out the garden window. Even her mannerisms became clear to me. The way she tapped her ear, she was happy. 
hummed a certain tune if she was worried. She was the well-thumbed book of my childhood, whereas my da was the hardback book that sat on the top shelf, well out of reach. She died when I was 12, and maybe that changed everything, I don't know. Maybe that wrote the past and the future. Maybe I wrote the hardback history of myself and threw away the well-thumbed one, I don't know. They're both dead now. He died 10 years ago. He was 80. 80? God, and I'm 50 now. You think I'd be over all this? And in some ways I am. Well, in the sense that I've buried it and get on with things. But I think I'm ready to read it now. Ready to read the hardback version and see. Yeah, I'm ready for it. But I put it off for 10 years. Another few minutes won't matter. I need to tell you about the funeral first. I felt like a stranger at his funeral. Imagine that. A stranger at your own dad's funeral. Martina, isn't it? No one called me Martina. Oh, so sorry, Martina. Such a loss. Except me dad. Martina, stand by my desk. Yeah, and her. The thing was, you see, the thing was, I was what you'd call a tomboy. I climbed every tree in the parish, fell in every river in the area, fought with every boy there ever was. I mean, there wasn't many girls at the time who were recreating Peter Osgood's goal in the backyard, who could tell you the name of every football ground in the football league. So one day, an uncle of mine said I was more a Marty than a Martina. And it stuck with everyone but me da and that odd teacher. I love being called Marty, but me da, he hated it. I used to wonder if that was it. Was that the reason he was so very, so very unknown to me and I to him? The world won't feel the same without him around. My world wasn't going to change much. Oh, he was one of life's characters. Oh, he was that all right. No denying that. I could. I could deny that. My dad, a character. To me, he was just a walk-on part. An extra in the story of my life. I wonder, we were just saying that, but who'd be wearing his, you know, shoes now? I looked at them blankly. You know... You danced him with the shoes. I nodded and smiled. An awkward, uncertain sort of smile. Half formed, half informed. Wonderful story, isn't it? We were just talking to Sean Kinsella over there. I followed their eyes in the direction of a man with a long black coat near the gate of the graveyard. I didn't know who he was, but he seemed to be entertaining a group of people, perhaps with further stories about me dad. You know, now, he was saying he thought it all started with Barry Quayle's funeral. You'd wonder why, though. Why would a woman who's just lost her husband give a pair of his old shoes to a friend of his? Probably just lost in grief. A strange one. That's what it is. A very strange one. Still, it kept your dad in shoes for years. Oh, it did. I know it did. It is funny how some things catch on, eh? I mean, who would have thought that something so... I don't know, crazy like that it'd catch on like that. It became a tradition like. Anyone died, your dad got a pair of old shoes. Weird, eh? Some of them weren't old like. You know what I mean? The shoes, I mean. Yeah, because naturally, I suppose. Not everybody had the same size feet. I'd sort of forgotten that. Because didn't some people go out and buy shoes for him or something like that? Yeah, I think. Who was it? Mrs. Brady. She did. She definitely went out and got new shoes in. Mr. Brady was what, size 11 or 12, wasn't he? <laughs> that would have been a bit big for your daddy. Eh? I was still looking at Sean Casella, telling stories to all who were passing him by. He looked like he belonged in this funeral. I couldn't bring myself to look at these two people, this man and this woman, who I didn't know, telling me stuff about my dad that I should know. Oh, 
he was one great character with your dad, so he was. Oh, yes, he was that and more. An awkward silence suddenly descended upon us. Maybe it was my lack of engagement, or maybe it was just my lack of eye contact, or maybe they just figured out something. Well, I suppose we should... We must... We really must be off. You know, time waits for nobody. Look, it was lovely to have met you, Martina. Heard so... Heard so much about you. And, and you know, things about you. Yeah, nice to be able to, you know, put a face to a name after all these years. Must get going. Like I said, we have to rush off, so... So, so sorry for your loss. And off they went, slowly, not rushing. I could sense their discomfort as they moved, desperate to share their thoughts with each other when they were far enough away from me. Sad when a daughter falls out with her dad, isn't it? She was a bit odd, don't you think? I mean, do you think she even knew about the thing about the shoes? I wondered that. The man they called Sean Casella beckoned them over as to see what they had to say about their encounter with the daughter of the deceased. Glances came in my direction, or so I thought. Sympathetic or accusing, I couldn't say. I could hear occasional bursts of laughter from the little group. Were they laughing at me? Me? Perhaps it was simply Sean Casella recounting another story about me da that revealed how much of a character he was. Another story that was unknown to me. I stood there by the grave pondering the irony that I had never spent so much time in my dad's company in such a long, long time. Marty, isn't it? I looked around and stretched out my hand to engage with his. He looked familiar, but in an unfamiliar sort of way. Danny. Danny Breslin, we were in school together. Remember Mrs Boyle? Chorus. Danny. It was Danny Breslin. I'm so sorry, Matty. So, so sorry. I mean, I hadn't seen Danny in years and years. Such a loss. I was bowled over. I hadn't seen him since national school. And here he is, turning up at my dad's funeral. I was standing there thinking if I could think of a single classmate from school whose parents' funeral I'd been at. None. Not even Jimmy Rortry. And he was my best friend in school. Such a character, eh? A slight alarm was ringing. But I assume he'd heard about the shoes from the others at the graveside. Heard about them? Sure me dad's shoes were the first he wore. It was me dad's shoes that started the whole thing, God rest his soul. His dad's? Danny Breslin's dad's shoes? That's what those people were talking about. They were talking about Danny Breslin's dad. And I didn't know that. I don't know what possessed me Matt to do it. I really don't. She didn't either. She just said like, I mean we were asking her afterwards. Why did you do that, Ma? You know the way you do with your Ma, but all she could say was that she had to give him something. And she was right. I mean your dad was so good to my dad, but still, a pair of shoes. I mean, come on. But fair play to your dad. He just said, sure, I see him. But like me ma said, he was so good to him. And really, when you think about it, to all of us, the whole family, we got our dad back. And so your dad will, well, he'll always have a special place in our hearts. Of course, then it dawned on me. You know, the whole thing that I told you about. Mrs Boyle and Peter Osgood and all that stuff. Couldn't ask me dad. Couldn't ask me mother and all that stuff. Well... I still didn't ask. Well, you wouldn't after that experience. I didn't want to know, wanted to forget all about it. But in time, I think it was around the time me ma died, I found out. And listening to Danny Breslin, it all made sense. As me ma used to say, I mean, she still says it. Your dad saved us all from the workhouse. 
He was a probation officer, you see. You know, he helped people who served their sentence. People like Danny's dad. He was so good to me, Dad. So, so good. There was one time about a year after he got out that he met some of his old pals. Got in with them again and, you know, there was talk of something. We don't know, but your dad got wind of it somehow and he took me down away for a weekend somewhere. He just sort of talked to him, listened to him, showed him what he had to lose. It worked. That moment changed everything for us. It wasn't easy. Sometimes my dad would see some of his old mates driving around in brand new Mercs. He'd be so tempted. You could see it. I mean, but Jesus, I mean, who wouldn't? Brand new Mercs and all that. But he'd ring you dar and they'd meet up for a point. We used to call it Criminals Anonymous, so we did. Time after time, your dad was there for him. Me ma for us. He was amazing, truly amazing. You should be so proud of him. But I couldn't be. I couldn't be. You see, he was my dad, not my probation officer. He was my one and only dad. But for some reason, and I didn't know what, we didn't connect. We hardly saw each other, hardly knew each other. I felt sad and angry every time I thought about him. And I always thought he'd... Well, the truth is, I never quite knew what he thought. He was a great crack as well. Great crack, that's what he said. Me da was great crack. How did Danny know that? That's what I was thinking. How did he know? I met him last about four months ago. Went for a drink. Lunchtime one Saturday. I suppose that was not long before he started to get, well, unwell. A drink? Four months ago? Are you hearing this? I, I didn't see him that often. Maybe once or twice every year. You know, since the dad died. That was always my first question to him. Whose shoes are they? Did I manage once every year? I didn't think so. We always had a lovely afternoon. Me? I had stilted, awkward conversations. If you could call it a conversation. It was more a case of long silences interspersed with momentary questions and answers, like some sort of spoken application form. The silences were louder and more revealing than the conversation. We talk a lot about me, Dad. We never talked about me, Ma. It wasn't like we discussed it once and thought we shouldn't do so again. It just, we never did. We both had a sense that we shouldn't go there. I suppose he was the main thing that we had in common. Without her, we had nothing in common. But you know, we talked about other stuff too. You know, politics, sport, the usual stuff. But I like talking about sport and politics too. So why didn't he talk to me about those things? And shoes. Lots and lots of shoes. I got lots and lots of silences. It was always great to meet him. I could visualise the two of them in a pub. Football on some giant screen on the wall and the sun shining through the windows, sitting there like father and son. Some barman probably asking him, What's your father want to drink? You know, he told me that he had, well, by that stage, he had ten pairs of shoes. I couldn't visualise myself in a pub with him. I'm sure you heard about the, uh, the whatnot. I hadn't. You know, the whatnot table. What? What's a whatnot? To be honest, I didn't know myself. It's one of those small table type things. Corner table. I suppose with a few shelves and whatever. Ideal for putting little pictures and family mementos on. Or so I discovered. I can't remember whose funeral it was. I wasn't at it. Your dad told me about it. Good to know that they didn't do everything together. Anyway, the way your dad told it, I don't know. I think, well, I might be wrong with this, but sure, what odds? It would appear that this woman, the wife, or, or the widow, she and this 
what your dad told me, but sure, you, you probably heard it before. Yeah, as if. I'm sure you heard these stories a million times. Was he fishing? She didn't have any shoes. You see, or rather, she didn't have any that she thought were good enough, and she hadn't bought any. I mean, you know that some people went and bought shoes especially for your dad. I did know that. Halla bloody Luya. I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? I heard it from two strangers a few moments before. Strangers who were in such a rush to get away that they were still standing talking to Sean Casella at the graveyard gate. Anyway, she didn't have any shoes. So what did she do? She gave him a whatnot table instead. Like I said, so he could put family mementos on it. I mean, the way your dad told the story, it sounds hilarious. He's trying to mishandle this table out of the door on the house while others are still trying to get in to pay their respects. As he said, he felt like a thief. Well, he was a thief. And then somebody asked him what he was doing with the table. He stole part of my childhood. He looked at them in the eye and he said, she didn't have any shoes. He stole my memories of my ma. The place erupted. Only a dad would have got away with that, you know, but awake like. He stole my chance to sit and chat with him about her. That's what families do when someone dies. They keep their memories alive. She didn't have any shoes. Oh, he was a good'un. Was your dad a real good'un? And yet here it was, a good'un. How do you square the circle? Look, Marty, I don't mind saying this to you, but your dad was in ways more of a dad to me than my dad was. You know what I mean? I looked up when he said that. Up to that point, I'd been looking down on the headstone where my ma's name was written. But when he said that, I looked straight at him. And I asked him the question I had wanted to ask the two strangers, to all the strangers, to Sean Casella, another stranger. You? Did he, uh... Ah, well, of course, you know. He, you know, always... Well, I'd ask you how you knew you were getting on, and he'd, you know... Tell me what the latest news was on you. When I asked him about me, well, I could see. I could see in the way that he responded that he wanted to move on. The words he spoke said it all. I was no character to Danny. I was the stranger. Not them. I was the stranger. His body moved back ever so slightly. His shoulders turned away just a little, but just enough to tell me that our chat was over. I brought it to a halt by introducing the one topic that would probably have brought a chat with me dad to a halt. Me. Oh, look, I suppose I, I, I'd better be going. Well, you know, work, you know. They know I'm here, but I, I said I'd get back by lunch. It's certainly tough at the top. <laughs> and anyway, it was great to meet you again. Seeing you, it brings it all back. You know, Mrs. Boyle and all that. Kunis? Are you still a Chelsea fan? Chelsea? What was he saying? Why did he mention that? Did he remember the moment when he realised that my dad was up for grabs? That despite his humiliation that day, that mine was even greater. Mine left an open goal for him to get. Anyway, I'd better be off before they come looking for me. See you, Martina. I could have sworn he called me Marty earlier. I watched him retreat across the grass. His duty done. His great friend, my da, honoured. At least he didn't stop to talk to Sean Casella. A little wave with the right hand was all that Sean Casella got. Sean Casella, yeah. Long, dark coat. A suit that looked like it would seen plenty of graveyards. Dark, polished shoes and hair to match. He glanced over, so I turned away, stared into the plot below. It probably looked like I was lost in some poignant prayer, but all I could offer was a silent stare. Me and my dad 
in a silent stare once more. Martina, isn't it? It's funny, isn't it? When someone stretches out their hand to shake yours, your own, without you even being aware of it, will rise to meet the incoming hand. So sorry. So, so sorry. He took my hand in his. Make no mistake about it. This was his handshake. He set the space and time, and at the end of it, an end that he determined. The hung in the air, the scent of his aftershave. Expensive, assured, sincere. Sean Kinsella, you wouldn't know me. I was a great friend of your dad's. No, I wouldn't, would I? He had the look of a man who could trample all over the ancient burial grounds and somehow make it look like an act of kindness. A man who kept bad things from happening to him. I didn't know the man at all. I was basing all of this on a few moments of watching him standing at the gate, watching the way people came up to him like he was the monarch of the graveyard. Funny how you can think you know someone from a few moments observation and not know someone despite a lifetime of being their daughter. It's great to meet you, at last. The at last hung in the air like an uninvited guest at a funeral. Like me, then. Despite the circumstances. Pity you weren't able to make it for the wake. Flights or something, wasn't it? Yeah, I missed the wake. What of it? I'm here in London. Have been most of my life. Away from all that wake stuff. Here in England, they talk so little of the dead that you barely know that someone had died. In Ireland, they talk so much of the dead that you barely know that someone has lived. So no, I didn't want to sit around some old turf fire, listening to stories about a man I barely knew, drinking cheap whiskey and singing old songs in a key that I didn't know. It's a pity you missed it. So many wonderful stories about your dad. So, so many. But I'm sure you did your own thing in London. I didn't. I went to the pub with some friends to watch the Champions League match. I didn't say a word. I didn't tell them that my dad had just died and that as we were watching Chelsea play Real Madrid in the pub in Shepherd's Bush, people in Ireland were gathering to celebrate my dad's life and send him to the next one. No, I didn't say a word. Not a word. Because I had no words. Never heard so many stories about shoes. I was able to smile knowingly. Funny thing is, it all started with a cousin of mine. I don't know whether you'd have come across the Quells, would you? But Barry Quell, he was about 70, God rest his soul, when he died. But it was his wife, Mary, who was the first person to offer a pair of shoes to your dad. From little acorns, eh? I looked at him with a puzzled look on my face. And I found myself blurting out some stuff about Danny Breslin's dad. Danny Breslin? I could see him doing the calculation. People, age, death, funeral, time of the year, all that sort of stuff. My God, Martina, I think you're right. You are indeed. Barry Quill would have died a few months after Danny's father. Isn't that strange? You think you know something and you don't? A moment of triumph. A moment of territorial gain by the graveside, where for one fleeting second I felt like I belonged. But it wouldn't last. I saw him turn away, just a little, to look in the direction that Danny Breson had walked. Just enough to let me know that he understood. He'd figured it out. He seemed to tense up a bit, and for a moment I thought my little triumph had unnerved him. But what did I know? What did I know? My triumph was to be short-lived, and the ground ripped from underneath me. Martina, when your dad was in the hospice, well, I used to visit him, you know, when I could. I could feel the ground shifting. I was in with him about, about four weeks ago. He was in good form that day. Went for a little walk, if I recall. Anyway, just as I was about to leave, he, well, he, he gave me something f 
for, for, for you. I could feel the ground collapsing. It was something he'd written, that's all I knew. Something he wrote for you. And he took out an envelope from the inside pocket of his jacket and he handed it to me. Here, Martina, this is for you. I have no idea what's in it. He never spoke to me about it. It was a white envelope. The sort of one you'd put a card in or, or something like that. I promised him I would give it to you. I took it in my hand, this white envelope, with a few sheets of paper in it. I looked at Sean Casella and said nothing. I felt a strange, hollow feeling of guilt. Guilt that I had not visited my dad in the hospice. Hollow because everything about that relationship had a hollow feeling of emptiness. Part of me wanted to throw the envelope into the grave, let his words die with him. Sean Casella looked into the grave as if he was reading my mind. I stared at my ma's name on the headstone. Well, I've done what I was asked to do. I continued to say nothing. I continued to stare at my ma's name on the headstone. Uh, I hope whatever he wrote to you helps. Helps? That's what he said. Helps. Helps what? Helps who? Helps where? I'll leave it with you. Good luck, Marty. He walked away, back over to the group at the gate. A group who awaited his arrival, his news, his views, his reviews. was Come Dance by John Hicks. You are listening to London's newest community radio station, NW Rad. Coming up in the next hour, we have our phone-in session where the topic will be the ultra-low... So, that was the funeral, 10 years ago. And in that 10 years, I've not opened that envelope. I've thought about it. Decided I would, and then I didn't. There's something terribly comforting about anger. Something very solid about it. It's like a good old-fashioned religion that knows no doubt. Permits no challenge to the established order. Is unflinching in its sense of itself. But now I think it's time to take the hardback off the top shelf and see. Dear Martina. Always called me Martina, so we did. Or maybe I always called myself Marty, who knows. I have to write this letter to you. I have to try and explain myself to you before it is too late. And I am gone. Well, you are gone. Well gone. And it is too late. I know there is no hope for me as I write this letter here in the hospice. They say I have weeks. But I feel like it is days. There's that hollow guilt again. I'm sorry, Martina, for all the pain I caused you and all the silences. Feel free to hate me. Feel free to be angry with me. Feel free to tear up this letter and rip any memory of me from your heart. But at the least give a dying man a chance to explain himself. I don't deserve that and my explanation for my conduct does not warrant it either. But I hope you will read this nevertheless. Your mother was the most beautiful woman I ever knew. She was kind, she was pretty, she was funny and she was enchanting. The truth is, I never felt I was good enough for her. I don't know what she saw in me. That's funny, because I never knew what she saw in you either. I suppose at least you're admitting it. I wouldn't have dreamt of asking her to go out with me. But we ended up sitting together at a touring production of King Lear, and we connected. King Lear? <laughs> oh, that makes sense. We went to a few other things, and then one night at the cinema, she reached out and took my hand in hers. I don't know why I'm telling you this. Well, I do. I'm trying to tell you I never did ask her to go out with me. I never did feel I was good enough, and maybe 
You'd agree with that. You bloody right I would. When we got married the following year, I felt I was the luckiest man alive. I felt so happy. We went to Galway for our honeymoon. It was just so wonderful. It was there that I first experienced a thing that would ruin me as a husband and as a father. We were in a pub just off Iron Square and there was a man there we got talking to. We were just talking and having some fun when I suddenly saw him, not as a stranger that we had met in a pub, but as a rival for my wife's affections. That feeling burned deep into me. It found portions of my soul I never knew existed. It consumed me. It drove me to protect my jewel of a wife from all those who might want to steal her. And worst of all, it pretended to be not just my friend, but my greatest friend. The one that would protect me and what was mine from all my enemies. To begin with, she laughed it all off. Dealing problems of married life, that sort of thing. She thought it would go away, and so did I. You see, your mother never realised how beautiful she was. She never saw that in herself. Never noticed that when she walked into a room, people noticed her, and that when she talked, people fell at her feet. She never saw that in herself. And maybe that's why she never saw I was so far beneath her in every way you can think of. Over time, it didn't get better. It got worse. And then, Martina, you entered the world. I was convinced she was having an affair. I was convinced that was the only way she could be happy with me, if she was seeing other men. She wasn't. I knew that. But my friend wouldn't let me think it for long, for my friend preferred me when I was enraged and insecure, irrational and unreasonable. I became convinced that you were not mine, that you were the product of her dalliances with men more worthy of her than me, and I treated you accordingly. I had no evidence to support this theory. Indeed, all the evidence pointed the other way, but my friend didn't need evidence. It just needed space to fester and ruminate and feel betrayed and abandoned, and then it and I could feel like a victim and a martyr. I'm sorry, Martina, for all the hurt and pain I caused you and your mother. A few years ago, I was chatting with Danny Braslin. You may not remember him, but you were in school together, and I worked a lot with his dad after he got out of prison. He told me a story about a day in class when you said, I played for Chelsea. I laughed when he told me that story, but inside I felt empty and useless. I'm sorry I wasn't your Peter Osgood. I'm sorry. I didn't score a goal for you in every year of your life. But above all, I'm sorry I didn't get to know and love you better. I'm sorry that I was your father. You deserved better than me. That's it. It just stops there. Wonder what happened. I mean, did he feel unwell or did he just take a break and never get back to it? Or did he have nothing else to say? I don't know. <sighs> That's a lot to digest. I never noticed any of that. It all passed me by. But then I was outside recreating Peter Osgood's goals. Maybe that's why I was outside recreating something else. Something easier. How do I feel? <laughs> Hollow, maybe. Numb. Something like that. I thought I was a disappointment to him. That I was neither the son he wanted, nor the daughter he had to settle for. That's what I thought. In some twisted way, I thought it was my fault. But this, this says it wasn't. 
the hardback was on the shelf before I got there. Still angry. Angry at the missed opportunities of my childhood. Angry at his basic failure to communicate. Angry with the fact that I spent so much of my life being angry. But yeah, maybe my anger will find stiller waters. Why didn't he tell me this? We could have talked. We could have connected. We could have had something. Anything was better than what we had. Why wait until it's too late? Why? And wearing his shoes today, you know, one of the pairs he got at a wake. I wear them from time to time. Well, I say they're my dad's shoes, but the truth is they're the shoes of a stranger, aren't they? Players for What Nots of My Dad by Brian Walsh was as follows. Marty was played by Sophia Harding, Mrs. Boyle, Christina Betts, the older Danny Breslin, Richard Harding, and the younger Danny Breslin, Elliot Harding. Woman at Funeral was Fiona Stewart, Man at Funeral, James O'Donoghue. Sean Kinsella was Phelan McCarthy, and Marty's dad was played by Jez Walters. Cast crew and creatives for the production were as follows. The producer and director was Richard Harding. Dialogue, recording and editing was by Mick Harris. Original music, sound design and audio post-production by John Hicks. <laughs>